Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for organizing this workshop and giving the, me the opportunity to present our latest results on short range magnetic correlations that we've observed with our thermodynamic measurements and uranium ditellaride. Uh, let me start with acknowledging uh, my collaborators, um, foremost uh, the people working with me together on this project here at KIT, where I'm currently doing a postdoc, Frederick Hardy, Paul Wietzki, and Christoph Meingast. The crystals that we have measured were grown um, in Grenoble in a collaboration with uh, Dexin Lee and Daiaoki from Tohoku University. And the high field resistivity measurements that I'm going to present were actually done by William Knafo in the High Magnetic Field Lab in Toulouse. Um, let me also acknowledge part of my funding. I'm funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation with a postdoc mobility fellowship. And part of this funding also comes from this Elastopumet um, consortium. So with this, I would like to proceed uh, to the outline of my talk very briefly. Um, I'm going to review some of the basic properties uh, of the already known uranium-based ferromagnetic superconductors. And then I'm going to talk about the newly discovered uh, uranium-based superconductor uranium ditelluride. What do we know already about this material? What are still open questions? Um, then I'm going to show you our thermodynamic measurements and I will touch upon what thermodynamics can tell us about the superconductivity in this material and about the magnetism. And then I would like to conclude my talk. Okay, so uranium-based ferromagnetic superconductors, there are three of them already known. Um, this is uranium germanium 2 uranium rhodium germanium and uranium cobalt germanium. Um, now, the best overview, I think, to, is to get from these materials by looking at their pressure um, temperature phase diagrams. You see here for all three compounds. Um, in the case of uh, uranium germanium 2, this material um, goes uh, into a ferromagnetic phase at about 50 Kelvin at ambient pressure. However, at ambient pressure, there is uh, no superconductivity that only appears at the finite pressure range of about uh, one GPA, where we have this tiny yellow region here where the material is superconducting. Now, in the case of uranium rhodium germanium, the Curie temperature is uh, somewhat lower and the superconductivity appears already also at ambient pressure and at 0 0.25 um, Kelvin. And in the case for uranium cobalt germanium, the Curie temperature is even lower and superconductivity transition temperature is even higher. So these, uh, these you can already see from these three phase diagrams that somehow um, suppressing uh, the Curie temperature in this material leads to a higher superconducting transition temperature. We can also look at uh, susceptibility uh, measurements from these three materials. You see um, for each of them a very anisotropic um, a susceptibility with a clear easy axis in each of the compounds. Uh, this is where the susceptibility diverges at low temperature. If we look at the magnetization that um, corresponds to this materials, then we see that if we um, apply a magnetic field and we measure the magnetization, there is a clear um, net magnetic moment also without an applied magnetic field. Uh, a clear sign for a ferromagnet, obviously. You can also see here that um, it's uranium germanium 2, which has the highest ordered magnetic moment, which then somewhat decreases if we go to uranium rhodium germanium and uranium cobalt germanium. Um, an important characteristic for superconductivity in these materials is the upper critical field. And we also see here the upper critical field measured along um, the different crystallographic directions of these three compounds. What I've also indicated you here in this phase diagrams is um, the Pauli limit that has been calculated for each of these materials. And you can see that uh, we are clearly exceeding with our upper critical fields, the Pauli limit along all directions and all of these compounds, which can be taken as a very strong evidence uh, for spin triplet pairing being present in these um, three compounds. Um, something that I also want to draw your attention to is that um, the lowest upper critical field in each of these compounds is along the easy axis of the magnetization. So always here, the easy axis has the lowest upper critical field. Something else um, uh, as a last slide for the introduction is um, that 
uh, we have observed also in two of these compounds um, a reentrant superconducting pocket at very high um, at very high fields, something that is also clearly associated with um, spin triplet pairing. And this is always when the field was applied along one of the hard axes in these compounds. So as a summary for these um, for these uh, three already known uranium biased ferromagnetic superconductors, if I wanted to um, put them together in one picture, um, I found this graph, which I find nicely summarizes this. So uh, uranium germanium two, as I've said, has the highest Curie temperature, which is then somewhat suppressed uh, towards uranium rhodium germanium and uranium cobalt germanium. And at the same time, the superconducting transition temperature goes up as the spin fluctuations in these materials increase. Now, the big question um, with our newly discovered uranium ditellaride is, um, where is uranium ditellaride, uh, if at all, on this graph? So with this, I would like to um, give you some background on this new material. So uranium ditellaride um, is, um, crystallizes in an orthorhombic crystal structures. You see here a picture of it. There is um, the tellurium atoms in green and in blue that uh, have two energetically different sites in this crystal structures. We have uh, the uranium atom here in red, which have the magnetic moments on them and which uh, align themselves along some chain-like structure. I, there's a different view of this crystal structure, structure, which I actually also do like very much. And this is here, so also here in red, the uranium atoms, um, and you see that always two chains that form along the A-axis are relatively close to each other, forming some sort of ladder type structure, which is which is then encased by this tellurium atoms. Um, cooling this material down, this orthorhombic crystal structure is going to be preserved. The main change going to be that these two um, uranium atoms do actually move closer to each other, but there is no structural transition on cooling. Now, superconductivity has been observed in uranium ditellaride. Uh, by several means. So there have been resistivity measurements, a specific heat, and also magnetization all showing a very um, nice, sharp superconducting transition. The um, superconductivity sets in at about 1.5 Kelvin, but um, it seems that uh, it can also vary between 1.5 and 1.8, depending on the crystal. It's the um, it's a higher to see than in all the other uranium-based ferromagnetic superconductors that I've shown you so far. And when we look at uh, night shift measurements that were also performed, uh, we see that the night shift is actually constant through TC, which um, is also somewhat an indication of spin triplet superconductivity. We can also, for this material, um, look at the upper critical fields. And here we see also, again, I've indicated the, the power magnetic limit of uranium ditellaride being somewhat uh, close to three Tesla. And also here we can see that uh, for all fields applied, all three crystallographic directions, uh, we have a clearly exceeding um, upper critical field above the paramagnetic Pauli limit. Uh, also, uh, when applying a field along the hard B axis of the material, uh, we see that um, we also get these en field enhanced uh, superconducting transition temperature that we've seen already for two other uranium based uh, superconductors. What's also special here is that even though this superconducting transition temperature gets here very much enhanced with the magnetic field um, at about 35 Tesla, um, superconductivity collapses and we enter a normal state. We can also apply pressure to uranium ditellaride, and there have been very nice specific heat measurements, which sort of show the behavior of the superconducting transition under pressure. So you see here the ambient pressure measurement featuring a clear jump here at the superconducting transition temperature. Applying pressure will initially suppress the superconducting transition until at a finite pressure of about 0.3 GPA, we have this additional feature here uh, appearing which then with increasing pressure successively moves upwards in temperature while this other initial uh, superconducting transition disappears until eventually at about 1.5 GPA, also this superconducting transition collapses 
and at even higher pressures, we're just left with some um, other feature and specific heat, which is unrelated to superconductivity. Constructing a phase diagram out of this, um, we see here again, these initial superconducting transition being suppressed with pressure. We have a second superconducting phase appearing here in these measurements at finite pressure. And then at, um, at high pressures, we have what is most likely an antiferromagnetic magnetic order in this compound. Now, one of the key questions that uh, has been arising is that um, whether this um, the superconducting phase that we have here, um, apparently appearing only at finite pressure, is also visible at ambient pressure because uh, there have been some groups which actually do see already at ambient pressure a two-step transition into the superconducting state, something that um, could be a sign for a multi-component order parameter. Um, however, uh, there's controversial reports on whether there is really a two-step transition um, or a single step. As you see, here's only one, and the second transition only appearing at finite pressures is also one of the questions I'm going to touch upon when I show our measurements. So let's move to um, magnetization. So um, also for uranium ditevirite, here's the susceptibility measured along all three crystallographic directions. We see also here a clear divergence for the susceptibility along one of the axes, the A axis. Remember, that was the axis where the uranium chains were forming along. Um, however, if we do magnetization measurements, we see um, that even at lowest temperature, um, there is no uh, net ordered magnetic moment without an applied field, making this material essentially a paramagnet. So even though there is no um, ordered magnetic moment anywhere, uh, we could still ask ourselves what is about magnetic fluctuations. And these have been investigated um, both by um, uh, NMR measurements and neutron scattering. Let's look at the NMR measurements first. Um, they do see um, a diverging susceptibility for fields applied along the B and the C axis in this material, which then would in turn, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> diverging one over T1 T ratio, uh, which uh, would in, in, in turn um, suggest dominant fluctuations along uh, the A axis of uranium ditellurate. Uh, also, what has been observed that uh, the dynamical susceptibility that was measured um, scales very nicely uh, with the magnetic susceptibility. And this is something uh, that can be anticipated for ferromagnetic fluctuations. Neutron scattering, on the other hand, um, does not see um, evidence for ferromagnetic fluctuations. It's all their investigated possible ferromagnetic wave vectors show a signal that is not much above the estimated background. However, they have uh, one um, wave vector with an increased, um, with an increased uh, intensity. And uh, this could then be uh, shown to be a, an antiferromagnetic coupling uh, corresponding to the coupling between these uranium ladders. However, it's uh, also here, it's uh, still very much debated whether it's antiferromagnetic or ferromagnetic fluctuations um, being present in this compound. And that's also something that I'm then going to talk about when I show our measurements. As a last um, point that I would like to make in my introduction on uranium ditellurite, uh, uranium ditellurite features a metamagnetic transition. And that is uh, seen when we apply a field along the hard B axis of the material. Um, we see at about 35 Tesla, a clear discrete uh, jump in the magnetization. Um, that is what makes a metamagnetic transition. It's a first order transition and we can also study this in uh, dependence of the um, of the temperature uh, here you see resistivity measurements where this is also observed as a clear step however when we increase the temperature we see that this step um, actually gradually disappears so we lose the first order character of this transition and um, these until and it then broadens and in the end becomes only a broad crossover which eventually at very high temperatures moves to lower fields. So if I were to construct a phase diagram out of this metamagnetic transition, I would actually um, come up with something like this. So um, I get uh, 
first order transition here at 35 Tesla until a temperature of about uh, 7 Kelvin, where we have then a critical endpoint terminating this first order transition. And then we only have a broad crossover, which would move to lower fields at some point. OK, with this, I would really like to come to our own measurements. So um, we have done specific heat and thermal expansion on uranium ditelluride. We, um, the specific heat was done in a standard um, specific heat option of a quantum designed PPMS. The thermal expansion, on the other hand, is a um, custom built dilatometer cell. We essentially clamp a sample between two capacitively coupling, coupled plates. And then uh, by monitoring the length change, uh, the capacitance, we can thus monitor the distance between the two plates and thus know the length change of the sample with varying temperature. Let's start with the specific heat measurement. We see a cool down um, from room temperature of uranium ditelluride. And essentially, we have a specific heat that is featureless, so no magnetic structural transition, anything, down to uh, about 1.5 Kelvin, where we have the first the, the superconducting transition. Um, seen here as a single sharp nice jump at TC. We can, of course, also apply a magnetic field. I just illustrate this here. Uh, you would suppress the superconducting transition. And also here, you can uh, already clearly see that we still have a clear sign of superconductivity at about uh, 4 Tesla, uh, which is already above uh, the Pauli limit for this material. Now, regarding the question of um, there is a one or two step transition at the superconducting transition, you see here uh, the published data which featured these two step superconducting transition compared to ours. I can plot them together on the same scale to illustrate this a bit. So you see here that it's, uh, it's not a resolution limit that we only see one step. It's clearly um, our resolution would be good enough to resolve two steps if there were two. Um, so this is not, not the reason why um, some groups only observe one step and others observe two. Additionally, our collaborators um, have done a very extensive uh, growth study where they did find also um, some samples that uh, show a two-step transition. Um, and uh, they did cut these samples. So it's actually the, just as an explanation, it's, um, it's the blue curve here, which is the original crystal featuring a two-step transition. It uh, was then cut by them and re with the two resulting pieces were remeasured and they ended up with one piece having a single transition and a second piece um, also having a two-step transition uh, at a different ratio. And uh, this scenario, this, or this observation is of course um, not uh, consistent with the story of a multi-component order parameter, but would rather be an indication for um, samples being not homogeneous and having um, two superconducting phases in them. Okay, now the thermal expansion measurements that we've done. You see here the coefficient um, of thermal expansion. Uh, a lot of, uh, of course, always monitor the length change only along one direction. In an orthorhombic crystal structure, I have to monitor it along all three principal crystallographic axes. And then with this, I can calculate uh, the volume thermal expansion shown here in black. In any case, um, uh, you see already in the raw data here that there is um, a very uh, strong anomaly at low temperature. It becomes a bit better visible if we plot the thermal expansion coefficient over temperature in the low temperature region here. Um, it, however, um, to get some insight into this anomaly, we have um, fitted uh, the phononic background here um, with a simple Dubai fit and subtracted that. And we are left with basically the electronic component to the thermal expansion. And we see. Uh, it's here for the c-axis, which shows the strongest anomaly here, that um, we have a Schottky type uh, anomaly centered at around 12 Kelvin. And once we are through this anomaly, we actually recover a linear um, coefficient of some expansion extrapolating to zero, a sign of a Fermi liquid state. So um, as 
thermal expansion is a very thermodynamic probe, but the question arises uh, why uh, we did not observe any feature of uh, this anomaly in specific heat. So we went back and looked. Uh, so again, here, the specific heat cooled down from room temperature. Um, I also plot here C over T and the low temperature region. And also here, we want to do a background subtraction again with a simple Dubai fit to the high temperature specific heat. And we're left with the electronic component at low temperature. And now with this background subtraction, we actually do also observe um, a Schottky type anomaly in the specific heat, which would then mark a crossover from a high temperature uncorrelated state into a low temperature Fermi liquid here indicated by this constant C over T at low temperature. Okay, so we, we have um, the uh, specific heat and the thermal expansion, both showing um, some sort of anomaly at around 12 Kelvin. From this, we can calculate uh, the Greenheisen parameter, which is essentially um, the ratio of these two quantities, and it's proportional to the pressure dependence of uh, this anomaly. And um, if we calculate this, we actually do come up with a pressure dependence of about minus 4 Kelvin per GPA. And if we um, put this in this uh, pressure uh, temperature phase diagram that we had before, uh, we can see that we will suppress this 12 Kelvin anomaly at a pressure of, of about 3 GPA. Now, obviously, um, this Greenheisen parameter is just giving us the initial pressure dependence. So most likely, this will even come down um, faster at some point. However, this is pretty much uh, the pressure range that also superconductivity collapses here. So we can, from this, actually um, suggest that this anomaly um, also um, has the same origin as superconductivity and suppressing it with pressure will also collapse superconductivity and only result in this antiferromagnetic um, state at higher pressures. Okay, something else that we've actually remarked by looking at this um, anomaly is that something very similar has actually been observed already in uranium germanium too. And for this, I show you also here um, the specific heat and the thermal expansion of uh, uranium germanium II. Uh, now, as I've said before, this material is a ferromagnet, so you have a clear Curie temperature. Uh, keep in mind here, TC is Curie, not superconductivity. Um, however, if you uh, ignore this very sharp transition here for a while, uh, you can see that also at low temperature here, this hump-like feature in the specific heat and in the thermal expansion is something very close to what we observe here uh, in uranium ditelluride. Now in uranium germanium to the origin of this anomaly was actually found. And for this, we have to come back to the uh, temperature pressure phase diagram that I've showed initially. Uh, so you see here that um, on cooling, we first enter a ferromagnetic phase here in this material. However, there's a second ferromagnetic phase at even lower temperature. And we can go from uh, one to the other via first order transition here uh, as a function of pressure. However, at a certain uh, temperature here, um, this first order transition disappears, becomes a critical endpoint. And uh, the uh, remainder of this critical endpoint uh, results in a broad crossover region, which can then be observed still at ambient pressure in thermal expansion and uh, specific heat resulting in this sort of anomaly. So this um, actually led us um, to, the, um, to the conclusion that maybe the anomaly that we observe in uranium ditelluride is also some sort of remainder of a phase transition nearby. So we actually started looking for this. And for this, we started applying a magnetic field and seeing how this uh, anomaly develops. Uh, we can, in our thermal expansion setup, apply magnetic field along the three different directions up to 10 Tesla. You see this plotted here. Unfortunately, as you also may see, uh, the anomaly does not change much with 10 Tesla applied field. So we have um, a broadening of this anomaly and a very slight um, shift to higher temperatures for fields along the A axis. It does sharpen a bit and move to lower temperatures for fields along B. And for fits along C, nothing much happens. And with this, we are unfortunately at the end of our capacity of our thermal expansion setup. However, luckily, um, we realized something, and that is that when you uh, measure the resistivity of uranium ditelluride, 
and um, you take, oh, sorry, my pointer disappeared, and you take um, the derivative, uh, you see that we can very nicely scale the derivative of the resistivity with the specific heat and the thermal expansion even. It also shows this um, sort of anomaly at the same transition temperature. And this is actually something that um, already was shown in the late 1960s by Fisher. Um, it's, a, it's a scaling that is supposed to work um, near a phase transition if there are short range magnetic fluctuations. So from this, we can first of all conclude that um, most likely there are short range magnetic fluctuations responsible for this anomaly. And um, second, we can um, take the derivative of the resistivity as a proxy for this anomaly that we've observed in our thermodynamic measurements. Um, so, and resistivity, of course, is very more easy to um, do in high fields. And that is, as I've already said, um, something that has been done by William Knafo. And we see here um, the first um, scans from his measurements, um, actually first up to 10 Tesla to see whether this actually does, um, does work. So you see here the resistivity in zero field in 10 Tesla, the derivative of it. And you see that the initial trend that we've observed with our thermal expansion is very nicely reproduced by the derivative of the resistivity. So look at let's look at let's go to the high field data, um, which is shown here on the right hand side for fields applied along all three crystallographic directions. You can also from this uh, we've just fitted it with a smooth function, taking the derivative, and you see the result here on the bottom panel. And you see that this initial trend is actually continued. So very much broadening of this um, crossover here um, and moving to higher temperature, a sharpening and moving to lower temperatures here and basically uh, not much change for fields along the C-axis. So we can now take this maximum and construct a phase diagram out of this. And we see here the result. Um, so I repeat again, um, fields along the A-axis of our crystal will move this to higher temperatures, fields along the B-axis will actually suppress it, and that is something that is very much reminiscent of the phase diagram of a ferromagnet, magnet, right? If we apply an, uh, a magnetic field along the easy axis, and uh, the A-axis was the easy axis in uranium ditelluride, we move, um, we basically transform our transition into a crossover and move it to higher temperatures, whereas a field along the hard axis will actually suppress our transition. Um, so this does resemble very much for ferromagnet in this compound here. Um, there's actually something else also that we've realized. So if we look here, um, the point actually where this, um, this crossover is suppressed to zero temperature is 35 Tesla. So that was the field where we had the metamagnetic transition also for fields applied along the B-axis. So just let's just take this um, B-axis uh, field dependence here. I have it here again, our thermal expansion points and then the resistivity crossover. And we put this together with the phase diagram that I've shown you before of the metamagnetic transition. And you see here um, that this lines up very nicely. And this actually is already the conclusion of what gives us uh, the observed anomaly here in zero field in our thermal expansion and specific heat. It's this uh, critical endpoint from this metamagnetic transition, which is here in high fields, still a real phase transition. However, then eventually develops into a crossover that we can track with our resistivity and thermal expansion also at low fields. Um, and is then basically shaping this, um, this anomaly here. Uh, very much an analogy, analogy um, to, again, this, um, this critical endpoint that we had in uranium to germanium two, which formed this anomaly here at ambient pressure. Okay, and the second, um, a second observation that we can um, actually do with this sort of phase diagram that I've constructed here is uh, when we add superconductivity to this. Uh, now uh, be aware that I've switched axes here to make it as a better comparison temperature field is like this now. Uh, we add a superconductivity here along the B hard B axis. I was telling you we had this re-entrant superconductivity uh, or this field enhanced superconducting transition temperature here at higher fields terminating at 35 Tesla. Now we know why, because here's um, the metamagnetic transition. 
However, this is also a phase diagram, which is very reminiscent of another um, ferromagnetic uranium-based compound, namely uranium rhodium germanium. So applying a field um, along the B axis, also the hard axis here in this material, will suppress the Curie temperature of this compound down to zero. And at the moment where we have suppressed this Curie temperature to zero, we have this pocket of reentrant superconductivity. So these two phase diagrams are also very similar to each other. Now, um, with this, I would actually like to um, conclude my talk. So I've shown you that we've observed um, uh, an anomaly at around 12 Kelvin in thermal expansion and in specific heat. This short key type of anomaly marks a crossover from a high temperature uncorrelated state into a low temperature correlated Fermi liquid state. We can scale the derivative of the resistivity um, to the specific heat, something which tells us that there are short range magnetic fluctuations responsible for this um, anomaly. We can calculate the pressure dependence from the Green Eisen parameter, showing uh, that the origin of this anomaly is actually um, the same as, or uh, the pre sorry, the pressure dependence of this anomaly is the same as superconductivity, suggesting the same origin for both um, for both uh, properties. And uh, we can, um, with the help of high field resistivity data, track uh, this anomaly and construct a phase diagram that is uh, very much reminiscent of that of a ferromagnet, and also. Um, the construct uh, the phase diagram that resembles very much that of uranium germanium 2 and uranium rhodium germanium. And uh, with this, from our thermodynamic side, we actually come to the conclusion um, that the magnetic fluctuations in uranium ditellaride that are responsible for this 12 Kelvin anomaly are most likely also responsible for superconductivity and seem to be of ferromagnetic nature, which would put uranium ditellaride then as an endpoint in this series here with the highest superconducting transition temperature, um, no ordered moment, but ferromagnetic fluctuations. So thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Do we have questions? Okay, uh, while people are uh, <laughs> getting to understand uh, the uh, out layer of Zoom, um, I have a question. Uh, can this um, two-step transition uh, be maybe explained via soft mode? Like, for example, you cut crystal or place crystal with such crystallographic axis, let's say, on, uh, on your uh, setup and then apply pressure or a little bit tilted, and maybe this can affect of uh, appearing, disappearing of a soft mode, uh, which can then affect, uh, make a different phase transition. Can this be the case or...? Um, so I know that it has been discussed that maybe internal strain in the sample could already induce an, at least part of it um, a different uh, superconducting transition temperature. If this goes a bit in the direction that you suggested, so you would maybe by putting this on a substrate induce or by growing this differently, you would induce some strain or some, some internal pressure, which then as we know results in a different superconducting transition temperature. Um, that was one thought, um, but uh, it's not quite clear. I mean, I really think this that cutting the sample and remeasuring and um, basically being able to decompose these two phases would rather speak for um, inhomogeneous uh, samples. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so a question from Jonathan. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thanks. That was very interesting. I just want to make sure that I correctly um, understood. So you, it seemed like you were suggesting this anomaly that was measured in the thermal heat and also in the resistance um, was due to crossover into basically into a Fermi liquid. And also that this, so this would sort of be the Fermi temperature and then the, uh, the the observation was that this Fermi temperature was basically tied to and ultimately suppressed by the magnetic 
uh, fluctuations. So that would seem to suggest that the Fermi, the actual Fermi level of the carriers was following this metamagnetic phase crossover, I guess. Is that is that fair interpretation or did I miss something? So, yeah, I, I mean, so the first thing I, I, I tried to follow all the different steps that you made. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So it's 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 correct uh, that um, we think that uh, you cross from a high temperature uncorrelated state into a Fermi liquid state. And that crossover is the anomaly that we observe. And we think that is the place where actually the magnetic ferromagnetic fluctuations develop and which then eventually also result in the superconducting state at lower temperature. Now we can suppress this by both applying pressure. This is what we calculated from the green Eisen parameter or by applying a magnetic field. And uh, applying a magnetic field, um, well then does different things to the, uh, to the superconductivity, right? But um, I think the main part of having the same origin was actually from the pressure um, behavior. So applying a pressure will both suppress this anomaly and also suppress superconductivity. Okay, and uh, and so then also suppress the Fermi temperature. Okay, thanks. All right. Okay, then the question from Alini. Uh, thank you, Christine, for the nice talk. Yeah. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, my question is, uh, so I see how beautifully your transport and specific and, and thermodynamic data scales. And so one is very uh, tempted to associate this with some kind of quantum fluctuations, which would be leading to the same type of signatures. But uh, maximizing resistivity in this type of uh, heavy frame materials is some, not something unusual. Right? I mean, we usually associate this with a coherence temperature when you go from uh, this liquid with local moments and delocalized electrons to uh, heavy Fermi liquid. Do you see any signatures of this specific kind of coherence temperature on top of this hump at 10, 10 Tesla, or would they be somehow convoluted? Um, so there is some um, some coherence temperature in this material, but it's uh, as far as I remember, it's higher. It's about 30 to 40 Kelvin which is then seen in the resistivity, right? What I'm looking at is the derivative of the resistivity. It's not the resistivity. Yes. So the hump uh, is, is a different origin. And this sort of I scaling see. type of behavior is also only shown to work close to actually, actually in principle, only close to a phase transition. Um, yes, but you're yes. right. I mean, the real the real resistivity on its own shows this, um, it shows a coherence temperature scale of about 30 to 40 Kelvin in this. Um, compound. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so do we have more questions? Oh, mm -hmm. yes. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, so I have just a question about uh, the, the the diagram that you show about uh, the material, uh, so the anomaly that you show the, uh, in a different way uh, appearing uh, in the two pieces of material uh, mm, yes. if compared to the original one. So uh, I have just a question about uh, um, the uh, relative percentage of material in the two pieces, first of all. And whether there is any effect of the, uh, let's say, the surface, so whether there is a, uh, any relation between the cut and the, the, the plot that you're showing. Yeah, so as a first thing, um, I, I did not do these measurements. These are really from, uh, from our collaborators only, so I cannot really quite know so much about the details. I mean, you can we can maybe have a look together now. I mean, it's the samples cut were relatively large. Uh, so you see you have a, about a two milligram original crystal, which you cut in two, and you, you're left off with, uh, with a third and two thirds, basically. Um, I do not think that at that sample size uh, surface does play a major role, but uh, I also cannot tell you how the sample was cut. I would, I would have to ask. Okay, because uh, the two pieces now I can see, so one is uh, three times the other. 
And so maybe there is something also related to volume because uh, this red part is uh, quite different from the green one, which is uh, again different from uh, the, the sun of the material. So it seems yeah, that it's, uh, it's right. somehow it's related to the volume. I don't know whether you have a statistics true. about this. So maybe it would, it would be nice to repeat the experiments with the different cuts and different, let's say, pieces, yeah. uh, just to yes. understand whether it's it, there is a trend. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think they're still looking at this. Um, from what I can say, I mean, it, it's a bit um, it's a bit difficult for us to investigate because for some reason all the crystals that uh, that we grow show mostly only this one step transition. So it's uh, it's it's relatively hard to investigate uh, why other people see two steps. But um, I think um, well, I, we have, we just have to wait a bit. I think also um, other groups that observe this two-star transition were trying to uh, decompose this. I think there's also some thermal expansion data from a group in Los Alamos, which tried the same thing. They were also cutting samples and then observing different step sites. So um, I think this is just about to be solved very soon. The preparation of the sample is uh, the same. So you're not no. mentioning that other groups are doing the same, but uh, do they yeah. prepare the sample in the same way? No, actually, there's two ways of growing these crystals. Um, and uh, it seems that one is resulting in crystals with, uh, with mostly one step transition and the other preparation technique results in samples with two steps, even though they are not able to see any defects on the crystals. So they have excluded that from um, from possible origins. How, however, we're not sure why one technique leads to one sort of crystals and the other two, two and different. Okay, I mean, thanks. one also has to, one, uh, just as a last one, also has to remark that, uh, that I mean, these, these samples were already grown um, uh, quite a few years back and initially no superconductivity was observed. So it did take uh, quite a while until samples were good enough quality to actually show superconductivity. So maybe there is still some relation to to sample with purity. Yeah. Okay, with the purity of the sample. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, good. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, time uh, for for further questions, but uh, you are very welcome to use chat, and I think the speakers will be happy to reply via chat. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we invite our second speaker. Ah, first of all, we thank very much Christine for a very informative talk. <laughs>